I am Dirk van Zyl. I'm professor of mining engineering at the University of British Columbia. Today's topic deals with the tools for incorporating sustainable development in practice. A uh, little bit on the outline. Uh, after an introduction, I'd like to look at the minerals life cycle and the mine life cycle, talk about those ideas, uh, stakeholders, we will move on to seven questions to sustainability, which is really the major focus of this lecture. Uh, and then a few comments on design for X and green and engineering, life cycle assessment, risk assessment and management, and finally, stories and scenarios. I think at this point, you realize just how difficult it is to incorporate sustainable development thinking and frameworks in practice. It, it is a challenge and it is always uh, good to look at what tools they may be available for us to do this and I think we've made quite a bit of progress but clearly taking the Brundtland Commission uh, definition out of our common future and directly applying that in practice especially to mining is a challenge. There are qualitative and quantitative methods that are widely applied, and we will cover both of those uh, in this lecture. The objective of this lecture is more to highlight these tools and provide more specific on some that are focused on mining. Clearly, to be exhaustive, one needs to spend a lot more time looking at all of these various tools and all their details. Uh, so let's start with the minerals life cycle and the mine life cycle. If we look at this figure that was adapted from a figure that Natural Resources Canada put together, we can see that uh, on the right hand side we really have the mine life cycle parts associated with it. We deal with all the issues around operations and closure and then within the circle itself is really the full mineral life cycle. We start with a need from society for the minerals and we then go on to the exploration phase and into the mining phase and into the, uh, the upgrading phase and then finally into the production of the metal and from there we go to the manufacturing of, of specific uh, components and then as we use the components or, or the, uh, it could be a car, it could be a washing machine, we then, uh, when we get to the end of its life, we can recycle it, we can remanufacture it. Uh, it can also go to disposal and basically return to the environment. So this is, this is trying to look at this full cycle and it, it is actually an important tool along the way for us to consider this full cycle of activities that's associated with mining as well as with the mineral life cycle. Uh, and we will focus more on the mine itself during this lecture, but clearly when we get to a discussion of life cycle analysis, uh, towards the end of today's lecture, you'll see that uh, the overall life cycle then becomes an important piece again, uh, including that of the mineral that we deal with. When we look at the mining life cycle in sort of in a linear fashion, uh, we can look at this figure here, which provides the life cycle stages in terms of exploration, and then we get into the development stage and clearly we've got the design, the final design, but within that period we also have the financing, the environmental studies, the environmental impact statements. We then go on to construction, from there on to operations, uh, final closure and decommissioning, and then a post-closure period, which really is uh, in perpetuity. And this really is a very important concept in mining, that as we design and as we develop projects, 
we always have to look at this full life cycle of the project uh, in terms of the economics, the environment, communities, governance. We need to include all of those as part of this life cycle approach. Uh, John Gadsby, who put this together, uh, also indicated with color sort of the, the approach to closure over, over time. In the 1960s, the life cycle really ended at the end of operations. There was not a whole lot of attention paid, and in most cases, no attention paid to decommissioning and closure. Uh, decommissioning and closure became uh, a significant issue in the 70s and 80s. And then finally in the 90s and into the 21st century, we now realize that the post-closure uh, activities may be even more significant. There are some timelines shown on, on these boxes here, but that's just sort of as, as an indicator. Clearly, every mine is unique, and one uh, would look at site-specific conditions to really understand uh, those time frames. Let's talk next about stakeholders. I'd like to start out by discussing the term. Not everybody appreciates the term stakeholder. And, and so the terminology that's developed over time uh, includes stakeholders, communities of interest, actors. And so as you read this material or material in this area, you'll see all those words coming up. I'm going to focus uh, this discussion using the term stakeholders, uh, but we could just as well have said communities of interest. Very important to make sure that all the stakeholders are identified and involved from the beginning of the project. Uh, in one of the other lectures in this series, uh, I deal with the issue of social license to operate, and we explore that topic in much more depth in that lecture. Informal processes to identify the stakeholders can be useful, but there's a lot to be said uh, for a formal process to make sure that we actually uh, understand sort of the lay of the land around a project. When we look at stakeholder identification, we find that there are various classifications that authors and publications have ascribed to, uh, to stakeholders. For, for example, in the MMSD final report, Breaking New Ground, the suggestion is that there are stakeholders with veto, there are stakeholders with a right to be compensated, there are stakeholders with a right to consultation, and then those who should be informed. And, and this is a useful classification, but it, it really doesn't help you very much in understanding exactly uh, what the relationship may be between these various stakeholders. And, and so another approach that has been suggested is to develop a matrix, listing the stakeholders in the first column under a series of categories such as government policymakers, implementing agencies, intended beneficiaries, adversely affected persons, and then across the other columns in this matrix, one would put down the identity and the characteristics and the expected stance towards the project and the influence and so on of these various uh, stakeholders. Uh, so just another way of looking at that matrix, it's the categories, the relevant stakeholders, within those categories, so if the category is uh, government policy makers, then who will be the relevant stakeholder individual potentially within that category? Uh, what are the characteristics of them, the social situation, the location, the organizational capability? Uh, what are the interests uh, of these stakeholders? Are they committed to the status quo? or are they open to change? And, and then finally, what is their influence 
uh, is it high, medium, or low? And then one can take all of this and actually plot a stakeholder map. And on this map, one can have on the vertical axis an influence uh, which is positive at the upper end and negative at the lower end. And you have interest with positive on the right-hand side and interest that's negative or very low on the left-hand side. And one can then decide where the various stakeholders fit onto this map. And once you have the map together, you can then also start looking at how the stakeholders interact. And really, I, I think the, the piece that we want to be clear here is that the stakeholders you really want to be the closest to are the ones with high influence and high interest. And uh, you really uh, want to uh, be sure that that is a group that does not become uh, upset with the activities at the mine or with anything else. And, you know, this is, uh, this, this is sort of the, the stakeholder language here that we're using. Uh, when we talk about social license, uh, we will actually try to understand how all of these stakeholders are approached so that we can make sure that we do get the social license to operate and also that that social license is then maintained. Okay, so, so the whole issue of stakeholder map or stakeholder identification, stakeholder mapping is an extremely important tool in terms of applying sustainable development on the ground. The next tool is the seven questions to sustainability. This was developed during the North American uh, regional process of the MMSD project and the objective stated was to really develop a set of practical principles that can be used to evaluate the contributions that a project make to sustainable development or sustainability. And to look at how one can apply this uh, in practice and, and how one would develop this test or guideline. And it's very important uh, to look at this because this helps us clarify sustainability practice uh, as it happens in, in the field. It helps establish consistency across all the applications and it also helps to clarify the case for sustainability. I will touch lightly on this, well, lightly on this topic because the the report itself is about a 55 or 60 page document with a lot more detail in it and I recommend highly that uh, you also look at that. Uh, the potential applications that have been identified are those of early appraisals of a project. Uh, maybe we have an exploration project that's ongoing and uh, there may be an acquisition planned on that project, then the seven questions become a very useful way of evaluating the contributions of that project to sustainable development and to see whether that project fits in with the overall portfolio and policies of a company. You can use it during the planning process to lay out the planning steps, uh, financing and insuring, licensing and approvals, uh, internal corporate reviews, uh, this has been used by a few individuals and few groups within companies as a tool to do uh, internal corporate reviews. It can also be used for corporate reporting and for external reviews. So if somebody wants to come in and actually consider a project uh, from a review basis, then the seven questions become a very, very, very useful tool. The case for sustainability is strongly made in the port in terms of the business and the commercial case. 
uh, an environmental case, a community case, uh, indigenous peoples as well as government case. And if, if we really look at, uh, at all of that, it really boils down to creating good relationships, working with these various groups, and through that there's less conflict, there's higher chance of getting permitting in a timely fashion. Uh, there's also the opportunity to get access to ore bodies in the future. And, and, and it's all part of how the company operates and deal with their neighbors to make sure that uh, everybody is treated in a way that uh, is consistent with the contributions to sustainable development. When we then look at the seven questions or the seven topics, we, we, can, we can look at this sort of diagram. This was put together by Ian Thompson of, on Common Ground Consultants here in Vancouver. And it takes these seven topics. I will next go through the questions in, in more detail but, and, and sort of put them in perspective. Engagement is right in the middle because it is so central to everything that happens at a mine site. Uh, human well-being, ecological well-being or environmental issues, those two are clearly related to the whole engagement issue because people are close to the earth and, and there's this interaction between people and their environment. We also need to look at the market economy the non-market economy, which I will explain a little bit further uh, in a few slides, and then governance issues. And all of this takes place against this backdrop of continuous learning and adaptive management. So let's uh, look a little bit at the implementation of the seven questions. The, the way it's implemented is really to, uh, or the suggested implementation, uh, is to start with a question, which is a goal, and then have an ideal answer, which is the objective of, of where we're going. Then look at a series of sub-elements, and for each of those sub-elements, then develop indicators and metrics. Uh, just a few words on, on indicators. Uh, if you're new to this area, I would recommend you look for sustainable development indicators. There is a large body of work, or there is a large body of work in this area. Uh, many indicators have been developed and it is good to look at how one, one actually moves forward in terms of setting indicators, how you apply them, what the data needs may be, how you decide whether it's a good indicator or not. Uh, in many cases, setting indicators is, is also an art, not just a science, because you want to have meaningful indicators for specific issues. And clearly, if we have an issue such as engagement, to set meaningful indicators for engagement will take quite a bit of thinking, more so than meaningful indicators and metrics for, say, the environment, because we have a very well-developed set of water quality criteria, typically, and, and other environmental expectations already in the regulatory framework uh, in many jurisdictions. So let's start with question one. Question one deals with engagement, and it basically asks the question, are processes of engagement committed to, designed, and implemented that will ensure all affected communities of interest have the opportunity to participate in the decisions that influence their own future, and two, are understood, agreed upon by implicated communities of interest and consistent with the legal, institutional, and cultural characteristics of the community and the country where the project is located. So it, it, it's a broad-ranging uh, question that deals with, with, a, with the 
full engagement issue around communities, transparency, knowledge, etc. And then if we look at the sub-elements of question one, it really suggests that we need to look at the engagement processes, uh, potential dispute resolution mechanisms, reporting and verification, adequate resources for the community, uh, for the stakeholders to actually understand or help them understand what is happening and, and to, to let them be at a place where, where they feel that they have uh, an, they're on an even playing field in terms of understanding of the information and the interpretation. And then informed and voluntary consent. Uh, and, and this is clearly a big topic now with the, the whole movement to free prior and informed consent, uh, which uh, will be touched upon again in a different lecture in this series. Question two deals with people. Will the project or the operation lead directly or indirectly to maintenance of people's well-being, preferably an improvement is what we're looking for, during the life of the project or operation and in post-closure. The issue of during the life of the project is usually fairly simple to evaluate because one can look at contributions in terms of, uh, in, in terms of jobs and, and economics and so on, but uh, clearly one also will have to look at safety and health and all of those issues. The post-closure part becomes uh, more problematic in, and challenging in many cases. So if we look then at the, hum at the people well-being, it's looking at these sub-elements, community organizational capacity, the social and cultural integrity of the area, worker and population health, availability of basic infrastructure, direct indirect and induced effects of the mine, the full social cultural costs and benefits and risks, how are they distributed, uh, the responsibilities and sureties uh, of the, the mine to the communities, the distribution of those costs, benefits and risks, and then uh, also the social cultural stress and restoration. I must point out that these sub-elements are sub-elements that were identified at the time when this report was put together. They are not necessarily the only sub-elements that one should consider. On a site-specific basis, one can actually change these sub-elements to make them more applicable to a specific community or a specific location. Question three deals with the environment. Will the project or the operation lead directly or indirectly to the maintenance or strengthening of the integrity of biophysical systems so that they can continue in post-closure to provide the needed support for the well-being of people and other life forms? So this is a wide-ranging question that's, that's, that has also been coined at times in will the environment be uh, maintained or improved during the life of the mine and thereafter. And so it's very much the same question, it's almost the same question we ask for people well-being that we also ask in terms of environmental well-being. Uh, again, in terms of the sub-elements, uh, the ecosystem function, the resilience, the self-organizing capacity, ecological entitlement, full ecosystem cost benefits and risk, responsibilities and sureties, environmental stress and action to ensure ecosystem integrity. And under each of these, one would then develop a set of indicators and metrics. The last one, 3.5, environmental stress and action to ensure ecosystem integrity. It's probably simplest to think of that in terms of water quality, air quality, type parameters and then the metrics become uh, all the various uh, 
constituents that, that one would look at with the limits, uh, regulatory limits or otherwise. Question four deals with the economy. Is the financial health of the project or the operation assured and will the project or operation contribute through planning, evaluation, decision-making, action to the long-term viability of the local and regional economy in ways that will help ensure sufficiency for all and provide specific opportunities for the less, that, less advantaged. So here we definitely want to have a, an economically viable project because ultimately if the project isn't viable then clearly the resources won't be there to actually also help with the community issues with the regional issues and, uh, and, and one would start very much with the economics of a project. So the sub-elements of this question deals with the project or operation economics, operational efficiencies, and those two things are usually the things that are very high on the list in, in all mine development from the corporate perspective. Uh, as well as from the financier's perspective. Uh, economic contributions, community and regional economics, how that fits in, and then this broader area of government and, uh, and broader society economics or economies. So, so this is, th these are all issues that one then wants to look at in this broader sense. Uh, question five, deals with traditional non-market activities. Will the project, will the operation, contribute to the long-term viability of traditional and non-market activities in the implicated community and region? Very often this refers only to, or mostly, to Aboriginal communities and where we want to make sure that all the traditional and non-market activities are actually uh, understood and that the mine is developed in a way not to impact that uh, to the point where, where the community can just not uh, have a long-term viability of those activities. In the areas where we really do not have uh, Aboriginal communities present, and, and I don't want to go out and, and give necessarily examples of that, but in those cases we also need to look at how communities may be encouraged by the mine to participate in non-market activities. In North America I think we would look at volunteerism like uh, volunteer fire department, volunteer EMT, and, and so on as, as important parts of communities in rural, especially in rural areas. And the encouragement of the mining company to their people to really participate in those activities or not hinder them to participate in those activities really become part of, of this question as well or could be part of it. The sub-elements would be Again, more looking at the, uh, uh, at the Aboriginal side, the activity and the use levels, and then the traditional and cultural attributes. There clearly may also be concerns about sharing some of these between Aboriginals and developers uh, because of concerns about uh, knowledge that will bring people in from the outside and and actually destroy some of these cultural elements. And so, so this, there's a whole lot of sensitivity around this issue that, that clearly needs to be understood. Question six deals with institutional arrangements and governance. Are the institutional arrangements and systems of governance in place to provide a reasonable degree of confidence at the capacity to address project or operational consequences will continue to exist through the full life cycle, including post-closure. Note, this does not 
necessarily only refer to governance in terms of a national or a regional government. They're including their regulations and their guidelines and so on. It also includes the governance of the corporation. Does the corporation understand that they have to have governance, policies, tools in place so that they can address the operation as well as the long-term post-closure consequences. Uh, this, uh, so it, it, it is very important that we look at that this is a much broader question than purely laws and regulations from some jurisdiction where the mine is located. The sub-elements for this is the efficiency and effectiveness in the mix of legislative rules, voluntary programs, market incentives, unspoken cultural norms, the capacity to address operational consequences, how the bridging to post-closure conditions will happen, and the overall confidence that commitments made will actually be fulfilled. These are all pieces that, that we need to look at again in terms of developing indicators and metrics. Question seven, the last one, deals with synthesis and continuous learning. Has an overall evaluation been made and is a system in place for periodic evaluation based on consideration of all reasonable alternative configurations and designs at the project level, including the no-go operation or the no-grow option, uh, consideration of all reasonable alternatives at the overarching strategic level for supplying the commodity and the services it provides for meeting society's needs, a synthesis of all the factors ra raised in this list of questions leading to an overall judgment that the contribution to people and ecosystems will be net positive over the long term. So this, this is really the question where we try to wrap everything together, but also the one way where we want to make sure that there's full attention being paid to, uh, to alternatives evaluation, and these alternatives evaluations clearly must look at the full life cycle. And, and so we, we need to come back to the life cycle issues again when we look at, at all of these questions as well. And the sub-elements for this question deals with the project level alternative, the strategic level alternatives, uh, which in many cases may be very difficult. The, the overall synthesis, uh, continuous learning and improvement. Uh, and it, it's this last part, I think, that most of us in the mining industry and environmental industry are very familiar with in terms of the continuous learning and improvement. And again, how do we set indicators and m metrics around that? So just to come back as, as a summary then, the seven questions can be looked at as these seven topic areas. Clearly when, when you delve into it and start applying it, you can decide to what level of detail you want to use this and apply it at a specific project or in your evaluation of an alternative, uh, an alternative say tailings management system uh, or anything like that. And so it, it's a very powerful process. I recommend it highly. I've used it a number of times, both in research as, as well as applications and, and teaching. Uh, I think there are great possibilities to take this specific tool uh, and apply it much broadly or much broader so that we can uh, look at the contributions that mining makes to sustainable development. I would also suggest though that this tool is very well suited for all development. It doesn't have to be specifically mining development. It can be development of a new suburb. It can even be the, uh, the entry of, of large stores into communities, etc. This tool is well suited because it, it sort of forces us to think through a much broader range of 
issues than just economic or just environmental uh, or just social uh, sort of in, in separate form. It, it forces us to really look at this as an integrated whole. Next, I'd like to spend a little bit talking about design for X and green engineering. This was an approach uh, that, that I first came across in mechanical engineering, but clearly it has taken on a much broader area of interest to engineers to look at this whole idea for focus a design on a specific issue, such as environment or society. And uh, the integration of these clearly makes it a lot more significant. But if one would look specifically at, say, design for the environment and green engineering, so it's all focused or largely focused on the environment, then one would look at uh, material selection, the construction process, the use, the recycling. And, and I think we, we can clearly put the, the whole green building or the North American lead process uh, in this whole realm here. And so, so that is another way of looking another tool for us to look at how we can bring sustainable development concepts into, into practice. Life cycle analysis is, is a very large area that's a very well-developed methodology with a very strong basis, a uh, very strong scientific basis. There's a number of international standards, uh, ISO 1440, and, uh, and I say plus on the slide because 41, 42, 43, 44, uh, and a few others cover LCA. It's, it considers the materials, the energy, and the service inputs in the construction, operation, and decommissioning of projects. So this is a full life cycle analysis. And what it looks for is to evaluate or calculate the environmental loads resulting from each of the activities along the way. And by doing that, then to understand how one can change the process to make, make it behave better, how one could change materials, raw products, etc., to actually improve the overall performance. It is analytically very intensive. Uh, and there are a number of programs and databases in use to do this. Uh, again, if, if you are a life cycle analysis expert, uh, this very short introduction is, is far from satisfactory. If you don't know anything about the topic, I would suggest that you uh, delve into it a little further. The overall framework, uh, as laid out in ISO 1400, uh, 14,040 deals with goal and scope definition, an inventory analysis, an impact assessment, an interpretation of the results, and the direct applications of this tool can include product development and improvement. That's where a lot of it is happening. It can deal with strategic planning. Uh, not only for companies, but also maybe on regional basis. It deals with public policy making. And, and again, for those of you familiar with this area and with the public policies, especially in the European Union, you will find that there's quite a bit of emphasis on LCA and the use of LCA in making those policies. It can also deal with marketing. The whole idea of comparing one product to another or one material to another, raw material to another, for the making of, say, pipes. Uh, for instance, copper pipes versus PVC pipes. Uh, and not only making them, but using them and disposing of them. And, and then if you can show through your life cycle analysis that the one product is more protective of the environment than the other, then uh, you may have a marketing advantage. And so people have used it in, in that context quite a bit. Uh, there have been a number of LCAs done for 
specific metals. Uh, there's one done for the nickel institute. There was one done for the copper, uh, the, the, the copper manufacturer, copper institute, and so. Uh, you can, you can look at all of these things. There's also a lot of companies using this as a way of actually building better strategies, both, both in the uh, sort of in the mineral end of the business, but also in the energy minerals specifically uh, and transmission, et cetera. The next topic, again, very briefly, is uh, risk assessment and management. This is a very significant tool in terms of sustainable development because while we don't necessarily ask sustainable development questions up front, that is not how risk assessment developed, but it is not difficult to actually expand it to include those things. Uh, for a risk to exist, we need to basically, or for Identifying a risk, we need to address three questions. What can happen? How does it happen? And what are the consequences when it happens? A risk is then a likelihood of occurrence times the consequences. And this is also a very, very broad area where we can look at qualitative as well as, as, well as quantitative methods for risk assessment. Failure modes and effects analysis, for instance, is a, is, is a tool that is used a lot in terms of understanding the relative risks associated with various elements. Some people uh, suggest that, or suggest that that's not a whole lot different from a HAZOP, which is true, and uh, there has been some work done to actually extend and extend that in terms of, of uh, uh, sustainable development impacts and uh, that can also be done under the FME, FMEA framework as long as one clearly address the, the correct failure modes or the correct impacts. Uh, more quantitative methodologies, uh, fault trees, event trees, uh, propagation of uncertainty using uh, Monte Carlo analysis, uh, you assuming or actually evaluating the uncertainty and the variability of parameters. It, it's a very, very large area. And when we get to the risk management side then, we basically have to address, again, the issues sort of in reverse. You know, how do we manage the consequences? How do we manage the failure mechanisms? How do we manage the potential failures? And, and we can very easily do that uh, by, by carefully working through everything. This is a very useful tool in, in the overall alternatives evaluation piece as well. If we start looking at the use of, uh, you know, again, look at various tailings management approaches and, and we compare these and also perform uh, risk assessments and risk management throughout the process, again, full life cycle, then one can gain quite a bit of insight and it will help making better decisions, more informed decisions, because we can include all the needs, the, all the environmental issues, the social issues, the governance issues, uh, as well as the economics of a project. Lastly, I want to say a few words about stories and scenarios. Uh, for engineers, this may not be a likely tool, but it actually is an extremely useful tool or set of tools uh, in terms of applying sustainable development in practice. Stories, uh, telling a story and writing or verbally of projects and how sustainable development was applied or not in practice is a very important part of learning. In one of the chapters in Bob Gibson's book on sustainability assessment, 
he actually tells a number of these stories and uses that as a basis to evaluate how, uh, how one can, uh, can use stories to actually understand the issues that are important. Because the stories will relate people, will relate their actions, uh, will relate their interactions with, uh, with the uh, ecology or with the environment. And, and all of us becomes a very, very important part of the decision-making process. It, it helps us understand the how and the what and the outcomes. It also, uh, it, it's just a very important tool in characterizing and understanding the overall field of sustainable development practice. Uh, clearly, in the verbal fashion, it is very consistent with the way that many Aboriginal communities communicate, uh, where they communicate in stories instead of communicating in writing in very formal language. And so, uh, so it's very good to learn how to actually apply these stories or use the stories to show the tools that we can use or to understand the tools that we should use. Lastly, scenarios. Uh, th this, this is actually a fairly large area of, of study and practice. Uh, th there have been scenario work done at very different levels, both in terms of projects but also in terms of whole industries or of whole countries. Um, there was, uh, in the er early 90s, there was a scenario done in South Africa to look at that sort of the future of the post-apartheid South Africa. And, and, and so you can find, in, again, in the literature, a whole series of, of these uh, approaches. This was another task of the North American Regional Process of uh, MMSD. Uh, there was a task to develop scenarios about mining in North America. And the document, Learning from the Future, can be obtained from the IASD.org website. And I'm giving you the, uh, the reference here, but it, it's easy enough to, to find this. Uh, the, the two pieces that were actually used to, to develop these scenarios, you know, after, after the, the workshop participants went through uh, af after they went through the whole series of, of issues that impact on mining, the decision was made to use economic performance and social values for the scenarios framework. And uh, again, having a uh, four quadrant plot with a sort of high economic performance and very positive social values clearly sounds like a winning place to be, while poor economic performance and conflict in terms of social values does not sound like a place where one wants to be in terms of mining. Uh, very useful tool to, uh, to look at whole industries, but it can also be used from a corporate perspective uh, to make strat uh, strategic plans and it is also very useful to include all the sustainable development concepts. So uh, today's lecture then was really focused on some of the tools. Th this is far from exhaustive. There are many tools available for us uh, to apply sustainable development concepts, frameworks, uh, qualitatively and quantitatively in practice. And I hope that uh, some of us uh, will actually uh, encourage you to look at this whole topic in more depth. Thank you.